Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. With me today is Greg Dickerson, and we're going to talk all things the Fed, inflation, Bitcoin, crypto, and much more. Uh, Greg, great to have you back on. Hey, Tony. Thanks for having me. Good to see you again. Uh, Greg, I was thinking about, you know, when we first started, you know, doing these interviews and uh, we've been talking, boy, is it over a year now or closer to a year? And, you know, we've been, we've been tracking the cycles and how the markets have been moving. And lo and behold, we're here in 2023 um, and Q1 is over and we got CPI data today, came in lower than expected. What are your thoughts on, on the data and what you see the Fed may be doing in the coming months? Yeah, so it was in line with expectations. You know, inflation is creeping down uh, in some areas uh, with you know what they're measuring. We still have a risk with oil. You know, if oil spikes, that's going to put pressure. You know, you, new cars came down a little bit, so that's kind of what helped skew the numbers. But we're seeing, you know, potential for that to spike again. We're seeing used cars spike again. So we're still in that teeter-tottering inflation mode, but we're down from nine to five. So, uh, you know, that's good. Uh, in terms of where we want to be, the Fed is most likely still going to hike 25 basis points in May with the jobs market as strong as it is and with inflation still being at 5% and their target being two, um, you know, they're still going to go ahead and hike that 25 basis points, but that might be the last one. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the minutes that are coming out uh, or that, you know, by the time people are watching this have come out are probably just, you know, going to say the same thing that they've already said. Uh, so no surprises there. But what's going to be really important at the next Fed meeting, not not only the rate hike, but what they say uh, about forward guidance, you know, that's going to be the most important thing there. And it's like you said, it's business cycle. So it's, it's you know, it's liquidity and business cycles. And the way the cycles work is when the economy is running hot and inflation starts to creep up, the Fed has to slow down the economy. They have to, you know, tighten credit, pull liquidity out of the markets and slow things down so that inflation can come back down because it's, you know, 50 or 60 percent of the population uh, is the one that's at the most risk. They have no savings. You know, they're one, you know, uh, car repair away from, you know, bankruptcy or, you know, not making their mortgage payments or their rent payments. You know, so that's a lot of people out there. So that's who the Fed has in mind when they're making policy decisions. They're not thinking about banks and Wall Street that you see out on CNBC crying for the Fed to pivot and, you know, cut rates and all that because their portfolios are suffering. Uh, you know, they're they're trying to keep people from marching in the streets because they can't buy bread and, you know, eggs and milk for their kids and their family. Um, so, you know, I think that's what we're looking at. We're heading in the right direction on all things. The Fed is trying to orchestrate, you know, a soft landing or a no landing, meaning avoiding, you know, a, a recession and, you know, something else breaking in the system. The big thing, you know, that a lot of people thought was going to create a catalyst for a pivot were the banks, but that's not really that wasn't a breaking of the system. That wasn't systemic. Mm. And you're mentioning the bank runs, right? Where you had Silvergate, Silicon Valley, and so forth. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, that wasn't a traditional bank failure in the sense of what, you know, killed the banks the first time. Um, so, you know, that was just simply a lack of liquidity to fund withdrawals. You know, people moving money into money markets, into treasuries, you know, getting these higher yield instruments. Uh, so the banks were just losing deposits. They didn't have the money to cover it because of the way the system works. You know, it's a fractional banking system. So they don't actually have the money in there. So the Fed fixed that. And, you know, Powell said, we're going to run the risk of too much tightening, too much hiking, because we have tools to fix things as they break. And what they did was a lot of people think that this was a bank bailout or this was QE or something. It's not. What they did was they lent the bank's money. And the banks have to pay that back. So they can't go out and reloan that. They can't speculate with it. All they did was just, you know, put that on the books for you to get your money out of the bank. So that didn't create, you know, QE or, you know, anything like that. And it wasn't a bank bailout. What they did was they guaranteed the depositors. Mm. And, you know, that's that's what they're really interested in. The banks are going, you know, the investors and, you know, the shareholders in the banks are going to lose their money in those situations. For sure. Um, so you mentioned the Fed will most likely raise uh, another um, uh, have another round of interest rate hikes. Are you thinking 0. 0.25 or like 0. 0.50? Yeah, 0. 0.25, 25 basis points, you know, quarter of a point. And I think, you know, they'll probably indicate that that's good for now. They're going to be data dependent. They're going to watch things. But, you know, we're seeing inflation trending down. We're seeing, you know, the job market, a couple of little, you know, crinkles in there that show a little weakness in the job market, but they need to see more significant damage to the job market before they can really, 
you know, uh, stop hiking. I don't think a pivot is anywhere in the future. I don't think rate cuts are going to happen this year. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not even next year, but we'll, we'll hear them, you know, maybe kind of talk about that a little bit at the meeting. And that's what the market's really going to be listening for is that guidance. And then even if they do talk about that or they do have to cut rates, that's not a good thing. That usually is a problem and a reason that they're cutting. And that doesn't mean, you know, markets are off to the races when that happens. That means there's, you know, damage coming and markets, you know, are going to reflect that because that's what the markets haven't priced in. You know, they've, they've priced in rate cuts and there's a big battle going on right now between bonds and stocks and, you know, the Fed. So the Fed is saying, we're not going to, you know, cut rates. And the market is saying, yes, you are. So mm -hmm. we're going to find out who's going to win that race this year. Who's going to win that bet? Yeah, I'm of the same mindset that they raise, like you said, one, maybe one more time or maybe two times. I don't know, but it's not, they, they then they pause, but they're not going to cut right away. Like it's probably going to linger there for another year, right? Maybe at, at that sustained rate level. I don't know. Yeah, they want to get inflation down to their 2% target. Then the real question is, and what you're hearing now is, you know, is that an appropriate target? Where'd that number come from? Why is that even important? So people are, you know, uh, really screaming about that because of where the Fed's taking rates. And where the Fed is taking rates now is basically normal levels, you know, where they can, you know, control that business cycle. So, you know, when the markets are down and, you know, the economy is sluggish and, you know, inflation is not a problem, then the Fed can stimulate to kind of stimulate economic growth. So this is a normal business cycle of tightening and loosening and tightening and loosening, hiking and, you know, reducing rates, hiking and cutting rates. It's, it's always been the thing. It's never been to the extremes that we've seen because of the pandemic. That's what created the problem. They went too far, too long during the pandemic. So the risk is they're going to go too far, too long on this side. Um, and they said they would rather risk that than stopping too soon and inflation comes roaring back. So, yeah, they're not going to back off you know, anytime soon. Hmm. Now let's talk about Bitcoin and even the stock market and so forth, because Bitcoin's been ripping. I mean, uh, across over 30K. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you feel we've hit the bottom? And despite these rate hikes, it's still moving upwards. You know, was it kind of we hit the point of there's no more sellers, like you can't sell it anymore. So the only way it could go is up. Uh, but, you know, this could be just a, a short term bull rally and then it rolls over again. Yeah, I mean, I think you can expect, you know, uh, a decent pullback to retest at least the 20K level without any kind of an economic event. So if the Fed can orchestrate, you know, a, a softish, you know, to a, to a mild landing where we do have some recession, which is just negative GDP, you know, where you get a little bit, a little bit of, you know, uh, lack of growth. Um, you know, if it's just a normal situation, I think what you're going to see just because it has had, you know, basically it's up 100 percent now close to it. Um, so you, you, you know, we haven't had a meaningful pullback yet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, definitely, I think retesting the 20,000 level, if that holds, and I think we can look for that to kind of, you know, run sideways probably through the rest of the year before we see sustained momentum into the forties. Um, if that 20 doesn't hold, then we're going to, you know, most likely retest that 15, six. Um, uh, and then if we have any kind of a severe economic accident incident, situation, then, you know, all bets are off. It's going to follow risk assets, just like we saw in the pandemic, just like we saw, you know, 2017, 2018, just like we saw, sure. you know, uh, any other time before when the markets were under stress, um, you know, in, uh, you know, 2014, you know, those areas. So, you know, Bitcoin's a risk asset. Um, you know, it's going to follow risk assets. Uh, you know, it is somewhat becoming a store of value for some people, but it's not mainstream store of value yet. It's still a risk asset. It's still tied to the markets and it's going to follow markets, although it has behaved like gold recently in, in what is what has been happening. Could you share a charts and show us what you're seeing as far as the short term, how high you think the price may get? Or, you know, have we kind of hit the top here at 30K, 200? I know there's some resistance there. So what I've marked out here, this is kind of an interesting trend line that connects that April 13th high and then um, of 2021. And then you've got this, you know, March high of 2022. And then here we are now, April of 2023. So these arrows all represent the last three years this time of year. Mm -hmm. And we saw what happened each time. And then Bitcoin, look how it's wrestling with that trend line right there. You know, that's it's pretty interesting how how these trend lines can work sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, 
So the real test for Bitcoin is, you know, can it get above that 30,000 level, you know, back check that and confirm and move on from there. And again, we haven't seen a meaningful pullback from this level at all to really test, you know, this major last higher low right here at, you know, 19.7. And that's kind of a lot of times, you know, what Bitcoin will do, what cryptos will do, what stocks will do. You know, they'll, they'll go, you know, recheck that last higher low. And if you go back here, you know, to the 2017, 2018 timeframe, you know, here's April right here. I marked out April in these timeframes and here's where it started to make the move up. But it ultimately rolled over in back check, but that was the pandemic. Sure. So it came back down. I don't think it would have. I think we were off to a new bull market right here, which would have been, well, actually more like right here. The news about the pandemic in Asia started coming out in February of 2020 before it hit the United States. I think really we were right here, July of 2019. We would have kept going, you know, on on from here into the new bull market had it not been for the pandemic. The mm -hmm. question is, without the two trillion dollars pumped into the market here, how far would would it have gone? You know that we don't know. Um, this is definitely you know liquidity driven. This whole cycle, but you know it's really interesting looking at these you know last time frames here, and then after this last fall off, you know Bitcoin did come back, you know, and kind of put a double bottom in here, which you know some people argue this is kind of what it did here first bottoming at 17 six and then double bottom check at 16 but usually it doesn't go lower on a double 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 bottom check it comes up a little bit higher which could have been right in here you know mm -hmm. in that december time frame at 16 three that could have been your double bottom then we're off to the races we got a meaningful pullback and then up here so there's a couple of different ways you could look at this if things continue to go well we don't have any accidents, you know, the, the there, you know, there's no big economic situations. You know, Bitcoin could con, you know consolidate in this area for a little while between you know this 29, 27 area and 32,000, which would be the top of this range, you know, that we put in back in May of 2022. Uh, and I expect Bitcoin to come up and test that 32,000. I think before it's all said and done, before we get a big pullback, it could pop up and test that 32,000 mm -hmm. level and then get another pullback and then it could go on from there if you know everything is okay. Sure. And are you are you seeing like maybe a 2019 type rally where it's it's like a retracement move. It's not to new all-time highs, but it's to, you know, a rally to a certain Fibonacci level or whatever it may be. Yeah, kind of like right in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was let's see what that was. Um Yeah, that was right at the 618. So, it, you know, if something like that occurred right here, you know, it depends on where you take that from. If you go from here, yeah. you know, 618, you know, that puts you right back around that 48,000 level from, you know, the peak back in 2021. Mm. You know, you could take it potentially from, is that kind of what you're looking at? Yeah, if something like that might play out this year. You know, if you took it from this last level, you know, 618 is right up at that 35,000 level. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that is a possibility. Like I said, I think we were, you know, I think we were off to the races here um, had the pandemic not happened, you know, and we had a little back check, you know, a little bit, a little bit of a pullback right in this area here. And then I think that was it. Mm -hmm. You know, we would have definitely been done had it not been for, you know, all the news that was coming out of Asia. Um, and everything is following suit. You know, Ethereum's running right along with it, you know, just kind of consolidating, you know, sideways to up, testing the upper level of these ranges. Same kind of thing. No real meaningful pullback from this level like we got right here the last time it consolidated. I mean, that's kind of what happens. It'll consolidate, you get a little pullback, and then it's either it either drops or it continues on. Um, you know, especially in, you know, when you're in bull market situations, price is rising, you get a pullback. Price is rise, you get a pullback. Price rises, you get a pullback. You know, that's your stair step up of price action. Uh, the interesting thing is the Bitcoin dominance. So this is you know, a little bit of channel that Bitcoin dominance has been in. It's a descending channel, you know, um, and we're at the top end of that channel, but it did break out. So it's it's broken a pattern that it's been in for the last couple of years. You know, there's June 21st or July 21st, you know, upper range here didn't quite make it in October 2021, uh, you know, July 2021, I'm sorry, October 2021. And then right here in June of 2022, and now we're back at this level 
it broke out of that channel. So if it if it stays here and confirms, you know, Bitcoin could go on. But every time it's been here, it's re you know reverted back and you know uh, ran back down to the bottom of the channel. This is what's keeping your altcoin season from happening right here. Bitcoin is still running. Um, sure. If you want to look at the total three, same thing. You know, a little bit more of a severe descending channel, and it has not broken out yet. So the altcoins are not quite keeping up with Bitcoin right now. Um, so, you know, Bitcoin's stealing the show. So all coins are going to continue to kind of bleed into, you know, Bitcoin right now. Mm -hmm. But once Bitcoin stops and goes sideways, all coins could get a little bit of a rally. Um, you know, if Bitcoin pulls back, you know, all coins are going to continue to pull back as well. You know, Solana's had a little bounce, but they're all kind of checking, you know, the same type of area as Bitcoin right now off of these, you know, consolidations. Mm. These um, are all daily charts that I'm looking at here. I, I know you're more of a trader. Uh, what's your strategy right now? I know, like I was buying the 16, 17, 19, like DCA from there. Uh, but what's your current like strategy? So I've been in stocks and, you know, so I'm a little different. You know, I'm kind of like, you know, Stanley Druckenmiller where, you know, I'll get an idea and I go all in on that idea. So I don't diversify. I don't do, you know, all these different things when it comes to trading. And this is only in bear markets like we're in where you have a lot of volatility. So I'll make big moves with the majority, you know, of what I'm using on one one idea, one asset at one time. So for me, it's been stocks because there's been a lot bigger moves in stocks than there has been in Bitcoin. Bitcoin hasn't really done anything, you know, even doubling. You know, I've I've had you know more opportunity in stocks. There's been stocks that have gone up 150 to 200 mm percent, -hmm. you know, during you know what we we've, we've seen recently. And then altcoins are going to outpace Bitcoin once Bitcoin slows down. So for me, it just hasn't been you know, a good enough trade with enough upside, you know, risk reward compared to what's been going on. But if you're long term, yeah, you know, back at that 15,000 level, you look at risk reward. Well, you know, worst case scenario was 4,000, 2020, 3,500, 2018. You're pretty good. And you know that if it dipped down to those levels, it would definitely shoot right back up. So I don't think you could lose at 15,000 other than losing the opportunity to buy a little bit lower. So that was a pretty good bet. Just like right now, I don't think you could necessarily lose long term buying at thirty thousand. Sure. You could lose opportunity if you don't have the cash available. If it good, if it dips and back checks, where you could get a little bit more. But you know, this thirty thousand has been a good number for the last few years, for sure. Um, and as far as stocks, you know, what are you seeing for the Nasdaq and maybe the S and P? Um, you, you know, are you seeing something similar to Bitcoin, like you know, a short term rally but rolls over to test lows again? Yeah, so stocks are kind of in that mode right now where they're kind of ranging, you know, waiting on the Fed decision and economic conditions. But it, it seems like, you know, we should get another little pullback in stocks. And again, it all just depends on what happens. You know, are we going to... So the big debate right now is recession and earnings. So what the market hasn't priced in is they haven't priced in earnings uh, in relation to inflation coming down in the labor market of unemployment. So the conditions that... The, that the Fed needs to stop hiking and potentially cut rates are the conditions that are going to affect the markets the most. Mm -hmm. And that's what's not priced in. A recession's not priced in the market because the markets don't think there is one. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, the bond market is pricing that in, but not the stock market. And uh, rate cuts, you know, and the effects of why the Fed's cutting rates, those things aren't priced in because we can't. It hasn't happened yet. So the thinking is, is that, Q, you know, the second half of this year going into the summer, and then into the fall that the markets are going to potentially have a big pullback. And that's where we're going to see recession and job losses and, you know, things like that. And that's when you're going to get your, you know, your big retest. And if that happens, Bitcoin is going to follow suit. You know, Bitcoin is not going to, is not detached from the markets. Now, uh, final item here, real estate, you know, what are you seeing there? It seems like things have hit uh, a halt on buying, selling, refinancing, building. Uh, I know it's hyper specific to the location, but you know, what are you seeing from the macro? Yeah. So in general, you know, prices are back up again. You know, uh, mortgage applications are back up because rates have dropped a little bit recently. So, uh, you know, we're still seeing a lot of markets. We're seeing multiple offers, not 50 offers or 20 offers, but five. So you're still seeing multiple offers, properties selling in days in a lot of markets. Some markets are still struggling, but on the national average, listings are down. Uh, inventory's down, days on market crept up a couple of days here and there. This is average house prices we're talking across the country. And, you know, prices uh, have gone up. I was just looking at one report that came in the other day. Um, 
you know, about that. And then the commercial real estate, you know, there's still a lot of distress out there. There's, you know, two or $3 trillion worth of commercial loans that, uh, you know, need to be refinanced or coming due in the next, you know, year or two. Mm -hmm. um, so there's already defaults happening. There was a $245 million multifamily property that was foreclosed on in Houston that made the big news and, you know, the real estate syndication world, um, you know, Blackstone walked away from, you know, a huge portfolio, but they're also buying too. So, you know, it's, it's still in, in the area where commercial real estate still has, you know, a lot of stress, a lot of loans coming due. Um, but that's mostly in the office sector, you know, mostly a multifamily where people paid a lot of money and, you know, put short term floating rate debt. And the housing market is still pretty dang strong, you know, because you can still get, you know, with a three, two, one buy down and arms, you can still get lower interest rates in the three to 4% range on houses. I saw, so I, and I didn't confirm all the details on this, but there's a 40 year mortgage term uh, that's floating around that they want to introduce to help people afford uh, homes. Have you heard about yeah, that? Yeah, but that's not going to be available to everybody for every house. I think that's for people that um, are in, you know, distress or foreclosure or getting behind. So I think it's, you know, to re, you know, refinance their existing loans. And then it might be, you know, some lower income buyers, you know, that kind of thing. So it's not just available for everybody anywhere. Mm. Now, uh, final item here, you know, the commercial real estate market, as you brought up, it's in distress a bit. Do you, do you feel that's some sort of bubble or co potential collapse, given that not everybody's back to office? I know some companies are trying to get people to go back to the offices, but I, I see in New York, there's a lot of empty uh, stores, a lot of empty business offices and so forth. You know, what do you think about that? Yeah. So that's not like a systemic event that's going to affect the economy, you know, at scale. Uh, most of the banks that, you know, have those types of loan exposure, it's very minimal, you know, in, in comparison to their overall uh, loans on, on the books and assets, you know, it's maybe one to 10% of the balance sheet of the banks. Uh, you know, most banks write losses into their business plan. They can take losses. I mean, they're a business, so they they factor that in. And, you know, what we're seeing is, you know, the investors are going to get wiped out. The government's not going to bail out the commercial real estate sector. Uh, they're not going to bail out the banks that, you know, made bad decisions. But banks really aren't at risk. They're, they're not overly exposed to that. Uh, it's just the natural, you know, cycle. So it's nothing like the housing market was in 08, 09. It's nothing like the banking crisis was in 08, 09. And, you know, even though it's, you know, several trillion dollars worth of loans over the next couple of years, you know, most of them will get refinanced. Some of them will get sold. Some of them will get foreclosed. So it's not a systemic thing. You know, mm -hmm. I think um, potentially what is systemic is, uh, you know, this over tightening by the Fed to get inflation down um, and inflation not coming down. I think that's your biggest risk to the economy is that if inflation sticks here and we can't get it down, we can't get the labor market to correct and the Fed has to keep, you know, rates where they are, um, you know, then I think that's where you could reach a tipping point. But it's pretty amazing how resilient the economy has been, how resilient, you know, consumers have been, you know, with everything that's going on. It just is just so much liquidity out there. And that's why markets have sustained like they have. That's why Bitcoin is doing well, because there's so much capital out there that still needs to allocate. Where are you going to put it? You know, that's what caused the problem for the banks, you know, putting it into treasuries, putting it into money markets. You know, people are now, you know, to your point, you know, a lot of people didn't sell Bitcoin at that 15. You know, you didn't get the shakeout that everybody was looking for. So one school of thought is, you know, with the markets and with Bitcoin, you know, maybe there is another shakeout to try to get those stubborn sellers, you know, stubborn holders to sell. Or maybe there's just so much liquidity out there and we avoid a big event that, you know, markets can kind of continue on from here. You know, mm. so it'll be interesting to see. I mean, there's a lot of people saying we won't see new highs in the markets and, you know, for another 10 years. Wow. Um, and as far as building uh, in the real estate industry, are you doing anything right now or are you on pause? Yeah, I'm not personally working on anything. I've got, you know, clients all around the country who are. I've been focusing on the markets. And then, you know, I've got a uh, tech company that uh, I'm a co founder in that I'm working on that, you know, has unicorn uh, opportunity. So, those are the things me that I'm personally focused on right now. But yeah, I've got clients all over the country that I'm coaching that are doing all kinds of building and development and all kinds of things. Awesome. Greg, always great information. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, it was good to be here. Thanks for having me.